So I greet you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. The Lord be with you, St. Margaret. And with thy spirit. And let us pray. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love thee and worthily magnify thy holy name. Amen. Now we have the very beginning of the month of June. <laughs> Went fast, didn't it? So as we have a tradition in the Anglican Church, we remember the entire Decalogue, the first Sunday of each month. So God spake these words and said, I am the Lord thy God, thou shalt have none other gods but me. Lord, have mercy upon us, and in our hearts Thou shalt not make to thyself any graven image, nor the likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or in the earth beneath, or in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down to them, nor worship them. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Lord, have mercy upon us, and in our hearts keep this law. Remember that thou keep holy the Sabbath day. Lord, have mercy upon us, and in our hearts keep this law. Honor thy father and thy mother. Lord, have mercy upon us, and in our hearts keep this law. Thou shalt not do murder. Lord, have mercy upon us, and in our hearts keep this law. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Lord, have mercy upon us, and in our hearts keep this law. Thou shalt not steal. Lord, have mercy upon us, and in our hearts keep this law. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Lord, have mercy upon us, and in our hearts keep this law. Thou shalt not covet. Lord, have mercy upon us, and write all these thy laws in our hearts, we teach thee. And I hear what our Lord Jesus Christ saith. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God, with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. O Almighty Lord and everlasting God, vouchsafe, we beseech thee, to direct, sanctify, and govern both our hearts and bodies in the ways of thy laws and in the works of thy commandments, that through thy most mighty protection, both here and ever, we may be preserved in body and soul. Through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. And let us pray. O God, the strength of all those who put their trust in thee, mercifully accept our prayers, and because through the weakness of our mortal nature, we can do no good thing without thee. Grant us the help of thy grace, that in keeping thy commandments we may please thee, both in will and deed, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. The first lesson is written in the sixth chapter of the book of Amos, beginning at the first verse. Woe to those who are at ease in Zion, and to those who feel secure on the mountain of Samaria, and notable men of the first of the nations, to whom the house of Israel come. Woe to those who lie upon beds of ivory, and stretch themselves upon their couches, and eat lambs from the flock, and calves from the midst of the stall, who sing idle songs to the sound of the harp, and like David invent for themselves instruments of music, who drink wine in bowls and anoint themselves with the finest oil, but are not grieved over the ruin of Joseph. Therefore they shall now be the first of those to go into exile, and the re revelry of those who stretch themselves shall pass away. Here ends the lesson. Thank you, God. 
Please join me in reading responsibly those portions of Psalm 146 as printed in the bulletin. <laughs> praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O oh my soul. Put not your trust in princess and the son of man in whom there is no help. Happy is he who, whose help is the God of Jacob, whose hope is in the Lord of his, of Lord his God, who executes justice for the oppressed, who gives food to the hungry. The Lord sets the prisoners free. The Lord watches over the sojourners. He upholds the widow and the fatherless, but the way of the wicked will bring to ruin. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. The epistle is written in the fourth chapter of the first letter of John, beginning at the seventh verse. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God, and he who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him, and this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the expiation for our sins. Beloved is God is so loved us. We also ought to love one another. No man has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us his own spirit, and we have seen and, and testified that the Father has sent his Son as the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him, and he in God. So we know and believe the love God has for us. God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. And this is love perfected with us, that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because he is so, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, but fear has to do with punishment. And he who fears is not perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, that, we, that he who loves God should love his brother also. Here ends the lesson. Thanks be to God. and verse 19. Glory be to thee, O Lord. Now there was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple, fine linen, 
fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, which was laid at his gate full of sores and desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lifted up his eyes, being in torments, and seeing Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime received thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, and neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou would send him to my father's house, for I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. And Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went to them from the dead, they would repent. And he said to them, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded that one rose from the dead. Praise, Praise be to thee, to thee, O Christ. Join with me now as we remember and recite out loud together the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of His Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us in and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Ghost of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge all the quick and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeded from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together the church have been glorified, who spake by the prophets, and I believe in one Catholic and apostolic church, and I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. So it's the first of the month, and I have an extraordinarily long sermon prepared for you. So get your stopwatches, get them going. I wish I was kidding. I'm not going to give you the whole sermon. We'll just get to as far as we can, and when I run out of time, we'll stop. Uh, this is a really important sermon. This, this is a big deal. This passage is really significant for the formation of the church, and for your spiritual identity in Christ. If you don't get this, you may not go to heaven. I'm serious. This is a big deal. 1 John 4 is a big, big deal. 1 John 4 is this reading about the love of God, and the specific nature of it, and the fact that if it's not present in your life, then you have no evidence you're Christ. And so people have spent their whole lives trying to be good, and they have a cerebral understanding of God. They may even know the Nicene Creed and can repeat it back. 
They don't have a spark of love in them. And Jesus is warning us. He's saying to us, those people, uh, when they get to the gates, I'm going to say, I, I didn't actually know you. Like, go away. Literally, that's the parable. There'll be people who go to the gates of heaven, and they go, it's not for me to come in. He's going, I don't, I don't know you, right? And so we need to pay really close attention to the heart issues of the scriptures because that's the stuff that Jesus taught. That's what Jesus got very concerned about with his disciples. It's sort of like, how could someone be with Jesus for three years and then betray him to be killed, right? How, how did that happen with Judas? Well, because his heart never got engaged, it was just the brain, just an intellectual understanding and hope of who Jesus was. And so Jesus warns us through his story and through all of Scripture that without the love of God in us, we are not functioning Christians. We're just religious. And so when I say to you this is a serious, very serious sermon, I mean it. Because some of you call me to your hospital rooms right before you die. And it is my responsibility to make sure that you know your Savior. That this is not an intellectual experience where you came and sat in a pew every week for 50 years but never ever had a relationship with him. And so if you get to that point and you're ready to go to the next stage of your life and you never had a relationship with Christ, I don't have any idea what's going to happen to you. I can't vouch for that. I can just say to you, man, I hope things are right between you and God. But as your pastor, as a priest, I can at least say to you now, think about this. Let's pay attention because I don't know your heart. Only God can judge the heart. But I can see the fruit of a changed heart. And the fruit of a heart that's been changed is love. And if there's no fruit, Jesus says, be careful, be careful. If there's no fruit, then I'm not sure there's anything there, right? It just may be an empty shell. And so he, he cursed the fig tree for stuff like that, right? He, he's like, this thing's supposed to bear fruit. It didn't bear fruit, so he cursed it. Like, there's all kinds of little tiny warnings in Scripture. But John, the disciple that Jesus loved, which is a really cool story in itself, he writes these words, Beloved, beloved, us, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. And anyone who does not love does not know God. So what I all just said to you, is a paraphrase of that first sentence, isn't it? Those aren't my words, although they probably got you excited. These are scriptural truths that have been written. And so because God is love, in this love of God was made manifest. So John tells us about how God sent his son to us, how he demonstrated his love, how he illustrated what he means when he says love. He shows us through his son what he means when he says he loves us. And then he says, Beloved, if God so loved us, this is verse 11 of 1 John 4, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us and his love is perfected in us. And by this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he's given us his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love and whoever abides in love abides in God. God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us so that we may have confidence... For the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. There's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, now this is where the meddling, you know, I started with this. If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. 
John gets in there, man. He's just, you know, he's pushing all the buttons, right? Thursday, we've been studying Lectio Divina, and Franny loves it. We're learning how to break down scripture, how to ask God to speak to us through the word of God. And so we took this passage this week, and we talked about it, and I did an entire homily on this same passage, but from a completely different perspective. And so the emphasis on Thursday was loving your brother, not hating your brother. And if, if you want to ask any of the seven or eight people that came Thursday, they can tell you about it. Because what happens is the scripture says you can't love God and hate your brother. Now, I thought I was off the hook because hate meant hate, you know. I don't hate anyone. I, I kind of like most people. But hate in the Greek here is missio. And missio means to dislike someone or to prefer another more. Now, that ruined the whole night for me. Because I can say that about a lot of people, right? I can say, well, I sure don't. You know, that person sort of annoys me. And th this one I really enjoy because they're a Patriots fan. And, you know. <laughs> So uh, that part of the scripture, we broke out on Thursday and kind of chewed on that a little bit, really got some of the depth of that, kind of applied it to our life. So that is one facet of this passage. But today, God's given me a completely different emphasis from the same scripture, Jane Marie. The same scripture can have multiple emphasis, right? So... The word study here that I want us to dig into is the word love because it's repeated over 26 times in these few paragraphs, right? And if God is saying we don't love him, we, we don't know him, if we don't know him, we are not going to spend the rest of eternity with him, right? Is that all logical and reasonable and understood? Okay. So we want to make sure then we know him. And that idea comes with the word love. Now, as I have told you before, and I have to remind myself, the Greeks were much more complex in their language than we are. And they had four different words for love. We just have the one, love. I love the Patriots, I love my wife. Not the same word, <laughs> right? But it's the same word in English, so the nuance is lost. It, there's a specificity that we lose in English. So in the Greeks, they would talk about love and they would describe it either as brotherly love, maternal, family love. That's the second one. Third one's like, I'm really <laughs> attracted to you, love. Eros, right? Sensual love. And then the fourth kind of love was agape, which is this divine love, this unmerited love. And so when you read 1 John 4, you need to know which of these four loves is it that's being described for us so that we can truly apply it to our life and understand what the scripture is saying. And so this is, this is what it really means if you were to take this word, agapeo, and pull it out of 1 John 4. This is kind of how the text would read. Beloved, let us embrace God's will choosing his choices and obeying them through his power, actively doing what he prefers with him, with him. That long two sentences is the word love. Let us embrace God's will, choosing his choices, obeying them through his power, actively doing what he prefers with him, that entire sentence is the definition of the word agape. Interesting, right? Agape. And in this text, the word agape and agapeo is repeatedly changed around throughout the text. Agapeo is the act of love. It is the determination to put his will and preferences above our own. Agape is the feeling of great pleasure that we get when we do his will. So when you read these passages and you go through them and you go, wow, okay, so he's saying in this study, he's saying that I can't actually even know God 
if I can't actually put his will above my own, if I can't actually determine that his plan and his purposes for my life are greater than mine, that doesn't seem like the word love to me. That, that seems like a whole other idea, but actually that means in the Greek, this is what the love looks like. See, the Greeks went straight to the practical, right? They didn't want the expression of emotion here so much as they wanted to see the demonstration of what was being promised. So in the Greek, when we say that we love God, we're actually not expressing an emotion. We're expressing a determination to do his will. I'm going to do his will. I'm going to choose his path. I'm going to give his path greater importance in my life than anyone else's. Now that is a really practical thing, right? That, that, gets, that gets way past all the emotions and all the feelings and the goosebumps and, and all that. It, it's absolutely practical. So as I looked at this, I thought, well, you know, we read this other passage every single Sunday that uses the same words in it, but in a different context. Have you ever heard me say, shall love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and all thy soul, and all thy mind? And this is the first and great commandment. We say that every Sunday. Guess what the word love is in that passage? Well, I looked it up. It's in Matthew 22. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, what is the greatest commandment of the law? And he said, you shall <laughs> love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend... All the law and the prophets. Well, guess what? The word used in Matthew 22 is exactly the same word used in 1 John 4. This idea of love, this idea of agape, oh, and of agape, these words are identical in meaning and purpose. And so, really, you could take 1 John 4's message and just drop it right underneath Matthew 22. So, obviously, church fathers knew this. And so they start every single Mass for the last 1,500 plus years with this reminder, this foundational truth laid out for us. Guys, you can't even be in a relationship with our God unless you know agape. Can't. Can't even begin to obey the law. You can't even fulfill the law. The moral law of Moses isn't even touchable until you get this first commandment understood. And then the second one's like it. And then they said all of everything that we do as Christians and as men and women of faith, all of it hangs on this commandment. Love. Love. So now I'm giving you the detail behind my salacious opening comment, right? <laughs> like I didn't make any of this up. This is the word of God. It's real and it's transformative and it's challenging and it's convicting and oh my gosh, it hurts. It's sharp like a sword, Hebrew says. So when you get this truth, when you realize, okay, so God's saying, I can't even begin a relationship with him. I can't even enter into some kind of covenant with God unless I agapeo him. Now, what's that mean again? Oh, yeah, yeah. Embracing God's will, choosing his choices, obeying them through his power, actively doing what the Lord prefers with him. Okay. That sounds, that sounds hard. That, that, that might be the narrow path, right? That could be the thing Jesus said in his parable, like, Narrow is the way to life, and few be that find it, but broad is the way to destruction. This narrow path could be this, this agape love, right? This putting God's plan ahead of my own thing. So I looked this up. You know, I'm in class, so I'm always reading books. Here's a really, really, really hard book to read called Handbook of Christian Apologetics, but it has a wonderful quote. 
It is the fear of the church and its teachings and the authority that scares people away. The church is concrete, visible. It is an institution that makes demands on the intellect to believe. And it puts demands on our will to practice a whole way of life that conflicts with our natural inclinations. Exactly like Jesus, who did the very same thing. The church doesn't wield a club, but it does wave a cross. The reluctance is usually moral. To admit that Jesus is divine is to admit his absolute authority over your life, including your private life, including your sex life. Can a drug addict think clearly and objectively about moral truth when it comes to drugs? Why are all addicts to something, at least we are, to selfishness at the very least? And this is the very meaning of sin, the very disease Jesus came to cure. Of course, cancer, if that's what it is, sin, is going to fear the surgeon. And that is exactly what you would expect. This is not a reason to disbelieve, though, the surgeon's claim. Just the opposite. You see, the old self in us is no fool. It sees that Christ comes to kill it. It knows Christianity is not a harmless theory, but something alive and dangerous. That captures, I believe, the threat of following Christ. And it captures the magnitude of the surrender that's required to follow Christ. You see, it requires us to subordinate our will. Our will to his. That's a big deal. That's a big deal. You see, the idea of having a relationship with God is predicated on a willingness to do our life his way. That's the requirement of following after Christ. And it is demonstrated by obedience. Jesus would say many, many times to his disciples, Sacrifice is great, but obedience is better, right? Like, you can, you can give me money, and you can give me time, and you can give me, give me, give me, but until you actually obey me, I don't think this is real for you. Like, this isn't real until you obey me. And the practical application here for me is pretty powerful because I, you know, I, I like to keep just a few parts of me Just, you know, over here. I, I, I'm just not sure I want him to know all that. As if. <laughs> but isn't that how we think? Like, so for us, a lot of people are like, man, I go to church and I do this thing on Sunday, but you know, really kind of the rest of the week I, I have my other stuff. And so, that, and, and so that whole compartmentalizing thing, it really is unhealthy for the Christian. Because we're not wired that way. We're not designed to split our spirit, soul, and body, right? Like it's supposed to come together in harmony. We're supposed to be in unity, a reflection of the Trinity. And so God is saying to us, hey, I want this all to become real and true. And the only way that that can really become real and true is for you to begin to follow me, which is obedience, to take steps of faith and to follow me. And it seems then that the acts of obedience are what actually transform us. Did you know that? Just why the church is so gung-ho about reading your Bible and praying and going to church. Why? Because these acts of obedience, they transform us. It's pretty cool stuff. Because what will happen then is if we take acts of obedience, then God says he'll come to us, he'll come close to us, and we'll come close to him. And the term that's described is to abide. We're abiding in the same space at the same time, together. And in that abiding, it says that this love of his is perfected in us. What's that mean, this perfected in us? I have no idea. 
But I have some hints, right? John gives us the hint. He says that when the love of God is perfected in us, when we abide with him, then it says that the fear in our life goes away. This is a perfect love casts out fear. Huh. Okay, so that would be a signal. When you find yourself being freed from anxieties and fears that have plagued you your whole life, when you find yourself no longer preoccupied with what could go wrong next, when that starts to leave your consciousness, something's changing in you, isn't it? So the, the love of God is starting to replace the fear of the unknown. The love of God is beginning to fill you up. And in that filling up of his love, it pushes out that fear. The anxiety doesn't have anywhere to live, right? It just, it just doesn't have anywhere to reside. Why? Because you've decided that whatever comes next, I'm going to let God's will be done. And that wrestling that you and I feel between us and God, it starts to go away. And we're not near as exhausted all the time, at least not mentally. And we're certainly not as exhausted spiritually. And so there's this transformation that begins to occur in the life of the believer that John is trying to describe for us in this passage. But he uses the word love so many times it's almost impossible to understand because he's trying so hard to bring home the idea that you have to have this agape love. So, here's what I wrote. When we allow the Holy Spirit to replace our spirit of flesh, we gain the attributes of God and can love each other without prejudice. We can love without fear. We can love without repulsion. We're able to see each other with the eyes of the Father. And so we can embrace God's will, obeying his will through the power of the Holy Spirit, and actively choosing to do what he prefers instead of what we feel or don't feel. You see, without the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives, we cannot rise above our emotions. We're tyrannized by them. Our feelings take over. We're stuck then, reacting and responding in the flesh with all this brokenness. That means without access to the agape love of God, we're unable, even incapable of treating each other with the dignity, respect, and esteem of a fellow child of God. John is saying that if the church is going to actually be in a relationship with God, then the way we treat one another should be the first and most obvious signal to the world that something is radically different about these people. <clears throat> Help us, Lord. We're entering a political season. And this is going to be tested. I will let these words speak for themselves. But you and I should pay close attention to how we conduct ourselves in the next seven months. You're not just representing yourself. You are Christians first. <coughs> that is our that is our home. So as we step into a contentious and polarizing and fear saturated media, don't buy what they're selling. You've got something better. You see, the church has been given the keys to real life. And if we embrace this truth and ask for the Holy Spirit to teach us even more about it, we could live this entire season of this existence without fear expressing the love of God to other people that we don't like in the flesh. People that we disagree with vehemently, but we see the image of God in them, a fellow image sharer of God created in his image. You'll start to see them through the eyes of Christ. That's a completely different experience. 
And it's different enough that it could bring evidence to a world that's doubting the existence of a God. It could bring the very evidence that they need to see to believe. Lord, help us. Help us to live in submission to your will, in pursuit of a relationship with you. Help us to live with our hearts engaged, not just our minds. Help us to live as you would. In this time, in this place, through the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said it is more blessed to give than to receive. to give thanks for all men. We humbly beseech thee most mercifully to accept our alms and our oblations and to receive these our prayers, which we offer unto thy divine majesty, beseeching thee to inspire continually the universal church with the spirit of truth, unity, and concord, and grant that all those who do confess thy holy name may agree in the truth of thy holy word and live in unity and godly love. 
We beseech thee also for the direct and dispose the hearts of all Christian rulers that they may truly and impartially administer justice to the punishment of wickedness and vice and to the maintenance of thy true religion and virtue. And give grace, O Heavenly Father, to all bishops and other ministers that they may both by their life and doctrine set forth thy true and lively word and rightly and duly administer thy holy sacraments. And to all thy people, give thy heavenly grace, especially to this congregation here present, that with meek heart and due reverence they may hear and receive thy holy word, truly serving thee in holiness and righteousness all, all the days of their life. Pray for Alicia, who's suffering with mental health. Jake, in his direction in his life. For Andrew, in his recovery. Pray for Elaine, for confidence as a caregiver. We pray for Dan, who's in legal troubles. And for Greg, his memory problems. For Phil and Sarah, who's lung and prostate cancer. Lord, we also remember our sister Ann Wilcox, when she rests in perpetual peace in your presence. Lord, I pray for our nation, for our country, as we enter a tumultuous political season. May your peace, May your peace be saturated in every single Christian. May we exude peace. And may the agape love of Christ, one full of esteem for each other, for respect, <coughs> may it be our hallmark. May we be different than our culture. And so, Father, may you also bless Thy holy name for all thy servants who departed this life in thy faith and fear, beseeching thee to grant them continual growth in thy love and service, and to give us grace so to follow their good example, <laughs> that with them we may be partakers of thy heavenly kingdom. Grant this, O Father, for Jesus Christ's sake, our only mediator and advocate. Amen. Now you who do truly and earnestly repent of your sins and are in agape and charity with your neighbors and intend to lead a new life, following the commandments of God and walking from henceforth in his holy ways, draw near with faith and take this holy sacrament to your comfort and make your humble confession to Almighty God devoutly kneeling. Almighty God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, maker of all things, judge of all men, we acknowledge and we lay out our manifold sins and wickedness, which we from time to time most grievously have committed by thought, word, and deed against thy divine majesty, provoking most justly thy wrath and indignation against us. We do earnestly repent and are heartily sorry for these our misdoings, the remembrance of them is grievous unto us, the burden of them is intolerable. Have mercy upon us, have mercy upon us, most merciful Father, for thy Son, our Lord Jesus Christ's sake, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may ever hereafter serve and please thee in business of life, to the honor and glory of thy name. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of His great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who with hearty repentance and true faith turn unto Him. Have mercy upon you. Pardon and deliver you from all your sins. Confirm and strengthen you in all goodness and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear what comfortable words our Savior Christ saith unto all those who truly turn to him. Come unto me, all ye that travail and are heavy laden, and I will refresh you. So God loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, 
to the end that all that believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Here also what St. Paul says, and this is a true saying, it's worthy of all men to be received, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Here also what St. John says, if any man sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sins. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. And lift up your hearts. We lift them up unto the Lord. And let us give thanks unto our Lord God. It is he and Christ so to do. It is very meet, right, and our bounden duty that we should at all times and in all places give thanks. And to thee, O Lord, Holy Father, almighty and everlasting God, therefore with the angels and the archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify thy glorious name, evermore praising thee and saying, Holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of thy glory. Glory be to thee, O Lord Most High. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And all glory be to thee, Almighty God, our Heavenly Father. For that thou of thy tender mercy did give thine only Son, Jesus Christ, to suffer death upon the cross for our redemption, who made there, by his one oblation of himself, once offered a full, perfect, and sufficient sacrifice, oblation, and satisfaction for the sins of the whole world, and did institute, and in his holy gospel command us to continue a perpetual memory of that his precious death and sacrifice until his coming again. For in the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it. He gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. <coughs> Likewise, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of this, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you and for many for the remission of sin. Do this as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. Wherefore, O Lord and Heavenly Father, according to the institution of thy dearly beloved Son, our Savior Jesus Christ, we thy humble servants do celebrate and make here before thy divine majesty with these thy holy gifts, which we now offer to thee, the memorial thy Son commanded us to make, having in remembrance his blessed passion and precious death, his mighty resurrection and glorious ascension, rendering unto thee most hearty thanks for the innumerable benefits procured unto us by the same. And we most humbly beseech thee, O merciful Father, to hear us, and of thy almighty goodness, vouchsafe to bless and sanctify with thy word and Holy Spirit these thy gifts and creatures of bread and wine. And we receiving them according to thy Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ's holy institution, and remembrance of his death and passion may be partakers of his most blessed body and blood. And we earnestly desire thy fatherly goodness mercifully to accept this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, most humbly beseeching thee to grant that by the merits and death of thy Son, Jesus Christ, and through faith in his blood, we and all thy whole church may obtain remission of our sins and all other benefits of his passion. And here we offer and present to thee, O Lord, ourselves, our souls, and our bodies to be a reasonable, holy, and living sacrifice to thee. 
humbly beseeching thee that we and all others who shall be partakers of this holy communion may worthily receive the most precious body and blood of thy Son, Jesus Christ. Be filled with thy grace and heavenly benediction and made one body with him that he may dwell in us and we in him. And although we are unworthy for our manifold sins to offer unto thee any sacrifice, yet we beseech thee to accept this, our bounden duty and service, not weighing our merits, but pardoning our offenses. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, by whom, with whom, in the unity of the Holy Ghost, all honor and glory be unto thee, O Father Almighty, world without end. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And the peace of the Lord be with you always, and with God's spirit. And we do not presume to come to this side table of merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in thy manifold and great mercies. We are not worthy so much as to gather up the crumbs unto thy table, but thou art the same Lord, whose property is always to have mercy. Grant us, therefore, gracious Lord, so to eat the flesh of thy dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood that our sinful bodies may be made clean by his body, and that our souls washed through his most precious blood, and that we may evermore dwell in him, and he in us. Amen. Behold, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. Lord, I am not worthy that thou should come under my roof, but to speak the word only, and my soul shall be healed.
Almighty and ever living God, we most heartily thank thee for that thou, thou dost not say to feed us who have duly received these holy mysteries with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of thy Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and thus assure us thereby of thy favor and goodness towards us, and that we are very members in corporate in the mystical body of thy Son, which is the blessed company of all faithful people, and are also heirs through hope of thy everlasting kingdom, by the merits of his most precious death and passion. And we humbly beseech thee, O Heavenly Father, so to assist us with thy grace, that we may continue in that holy fellowship and do all such good works as thou hast prepared for us to walk in. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom we be in the Holy Ghost, be all honor and glory, the world without end. Amen. Please stand. And so, Father, I ask a blessing on this parish and all who can hear my voice. May we be reconnected this week with you. May we find ourselves refreshed and renewed in our spirit. And may we pursue you. May we seek you out in the quiet moments of our life. I ask this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Glory be to God on high and on earth. Peace, goodwill towards men. We praise thee. We bless thee, we worship thee, we glorify thee, we give thanks to thee for thy great glory. O Lord God, heavenly King, God the Father, Almighty. O Lord, the only God, Son, Jesus Christ. O Lord God, Lamb of God, Son of the Father, that takest away the sins of the world, have mercy upon us. Thou that takest away the sins of the world, Receive our prayer. Thou that sittest at the right hand of God the Father, have mercy upon us. 
For thou only art holy. Thou only art the Lord. Thou only, O Christ, with the Holy Ghost, art most high in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Now the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessings of God Almighty, Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost be among you and remain with you. Always. Amen. Amen. Uh...